<clears throat> so, um, how's my audio? <clears throat> so, um, how's my audio? <clears throat> so, um... Wait, why can I hear an echo? What the fuck? Echo, echo. Yeah, okay, it's stopped now. <laughs> well, it triple. It must have tripled because of a feedback loop, but that doesn't make sense because my there's no direct audio to my like desktop right now, which is weird. But um, yeah, okay. Am I loud enough? Are we good? Great. Uh, I haven't really planned this out in any great level of detail or anything. Uh, I think I'm just going to get started. It has been a while since I have uh, performed games at people, I guess. So, let's see. Where's the thing? Go on. Okay, right. So it's been a while since I streamed anything. It's been a while since I played publicly in any way. So um, I'm not going to think about it too much. Does anyone have preferences re with regards to names? Because I'm actually playing the new version, which is Dark Souls Remastered. My hundreds of hours of this game have all been in uh, Prepare to Die edition, but there is a uh, temporary discount for anyone who has Prepare to Die edition to buy the remastered version, which ends in a couple months, so I thought I would pick that up now and get started with it. But that does mean that I had none of my pre-existing characters. Um... I'm going to be incredibly boring and name it after myself. I was thinking a little bit about classes earlier. Um, traditionally, I usually start with the deprived and then decide what I'm doing um, during gameplay. But it's been it's been a while. I kind of like starting with some decent gear. I don't really want to do a melee class because most runs are melee, and uh, I'm bored of it. Thief is always fun because of the focus on parrying rather than on just overwhelming uh, physical power. Hunter starts with a bow, which is useful. Sorcerer is easy mode. And... Pyromancer. Pyromancer is generally recommended where people actually start, but um, there's reasons why it's a good starting class, but Sorcerer is the actual easy mode. And I've never really done a faith build, so I'm tempted to go with Cleric, but when I started streaming Dark Souls a few months back, and I did a couple sessions, I did do a faith build that time. So I might go with a faith build, I might go with Sorcerer just because it's really fun to just blast through the early levels quite easily. Or maybe I should just go Deprived and decide later. Anyone got preferences? Well, okay, fair enough. I'll just go with Faith then, if no one else has any preferences. Um, I'm going with a big round attitude in general. Oh, okay. Well, I'd rather go with Sorcerer than Faith, uh, than Priest in general, just because the, um, the Priest spells tend to be quite passive and unimpactful. It's things like healing that you can do outside of combat. Whereas sorcerers do a lot more running and jumping and climbing trees. So in that case, I will go with my gut and play sorcerer because it's it's fun, but it is it is absolutely easy mode. But hey, you know I haven't streamed in ages, so why not go with easy mode? Um, the starting gifts are, you know, uh, kind of a weird decision. You can get a rare healing item, a 
decent damage dealing items from humanity, which is a resource we'll use later. Binoculars, which you can find in the starting area of the game. The pendant, which literally does nothing and is a joke put in by the developer. The master key, which is very convenient for some stuff I'll talk about when it comes up. The tiny being's ring, which is a, a small healing, uh, a small health pool increase. And the old witch's ring, which is what I usually go with. Which does nothing early on, but lets you speak to an NPC in the late game. Uh, I like the bun personally, and I like red hair. Actually, let's go for bright red, because why not? So, time for the opening game cutscene, which probably everyone's seen already, so I should probably skip, but let's go anyway. In the age of ancients, the world was unformed, shrouded by fog. A land of grey crags, arch trees, and everlasting dragons. But then there was fire. And with fire came disparity. Heat and cold. Life and death. And of course, light and dark. Then from the dark, they came and found the souls of lords within the flame. The first of the day. The witch of Isolith and her daughters of Chaos. Gwyn, the Lord of Sunlight and his faithful knights. And the furtive pygmy, so easily forgotten. With the strength of lords, they challenged the dragons. Gwyn's mighty bolts peeled apart their stone skins. The witches weaved great firestorms. Nito unleashed a miasma of death and disease. Seath the scales betrayed his own, and the dragons were no more. Soon the flames will fade, and only dark will remain. Even now, there are only embers, and man sees not light, but only endless nights. And amongst the living are seen Carriers of the accursed dark side. Yes, indeed. The dark sign brands the undead. And in this land, the undead are corralled and led to the north.
where they are locked away to await the end of the world. Before we get to anything else, I want to point out that I find it really interesting that um, Oscar doesn't just give you an item when he drops that down through the ceiling. He's clearly helping you, but he drops a whole corpse. There's kind of a... I don't know, there's a weirdness to that that sort of sets you up to... Oh hey, I didn't notice this. So there's going to be a few times when I'm like, oh that's cool, because this is the remastered version, which I haven't played except for a couple hours earlier today. But, um, yeah, in the original game and in Prepare to Die edition, you can't really see in there. It's too dark for you to see what's going on. You can hear that guy stomping around and you can sort of see some moving in the distance and you can see him if you bump the gamma way up. But, uh, yeah, that makes that a much clearer clue that you can come back later and fight an additional boss, I guess. So, um, yeah, the thing, the thing about dropping the key is that Dark Souls has this whole kind of thing about taking gameplay abstractions and blending them into a part of the world. I don't know if you've ever noticed this while playing, but you never ever find an item that is not currently on a corpse. Um, the only times that you do are when you have killed something and, it, and its body has disappeared, and uh, it drops a thing. Uh, isn't what his job? If you mean corralling people and taking them to the north, then that's not his thing. <coughs> like, his job is the same as yours. He's on the same quest as you, essentially. And he tells you what's up. Bye. I love the comic timing of the uh, combat music kicking in the, just the second before the door slams down. But, uh, yeah, so, yeah, you never find an item that's not on a corpse. I don't think there's any times you ever do, apart from drops from people you specifically have killed. Which, it's the only time they really do this, they, where they acknowledge that specific component of the sort of, like, narrative elements of the world. It's, uh, it's much more ambiguous and blended in with regards to most other things, like the, uh, bonfires and all of these other things that do and don't mean something. But no, I think he straight up he drops it in because they were like, well, we've decided that you only find items on corpses, so if you're supposed to find... Oh, that's terrible. Oh, poor Icarus. Uh, we should be able to beat the Asylum Demon without even getting hit, really. Also, as a tutorial, the Asylum serves a pretty decent like, role. It does set you up to be paranoid about things like traps and unexpected enemies and so on. I love the, uh, the framing of this. This is just good composition. There's a real art in game design to making... Oh, thank goodness. I'm done for, I'm afraid. I'll die soon, then lose my sanity. I wish to ask something of you. You and I, we're both undead. Hear me out, will you? Uh, before he interrupts me, I'm just going to finish my thought, which is there's a real artistry in game design to setting up composition when you know that you're participating with the player. The player is, is an active participant in that composition, so it's there's a real artistry to getting people to look at things the right way and make them see things at the right angles to get the compositions that look good. Regrettably, I have failed in my mission, but perhaps you can keep the torch lit. There is an old saying in my family. Thou who art undead art chosen, and thine exodus from the undead asylum maketh pilgrimage to the land of ancient lords. When thou ringeth the bell of awakening, the fair
fate of the undead, thou shalt know. Well, now you know. And I can die with hope in my heart. Oh, one more thing. Here, take this. Oops, I skipped a line there oh, accidentally. And this. Now I must bid farewell. I would hate to harm you after death. So go now. And thank you. It's interesting that he says he can die with hope in his heart. Because, uh... Now I must bid farewell. I would hate to and thank you. The thing about hollowing is that it's kind of more about... Um... Losing hope. It's something that can't really happen to you unless you give in to the despair. But I will not be playing Kingsfield Field anytime soon. I kind of always wanted to, but um, I should definitely get back to. Uh, uh, oh god, damn it! Uh, Metal Wolf Chaos, the most American game ever made, somehow made by this very Japanese studio, who are very well known for very kind of contemplative evocative experiences rather than um, the presidential mech suit. But I've never actually played Kingsfield. Um, I don't know even how easy it is to get a hold of nowadays. But uh, yeah, so it's also a nice little neat detail that um, when Oscar dies, you get his souls, just as you would for, you know, any other opponent that you kill or that dies near you. Because you harvesting souls isn't reliant on you killing an opponent, it, they just have to die near you. You can knock them off cliffs and stuff, and that's still... Or you can let them drop off cliffs. Um, even though I can, like, parry most of the shitty ordinary hollow men pretty easily throughout the game, something about these scraggly guys... I find them so difficult to parry. I don't need to parry this early, but... Um, like, they're not tough enough to need that, really, but I do find myself trying to my own detriment. There's something amusing to me, though, that I, if he start as the sorcerer, or if I start as the sorcerer, I then don't cast a spell for ages, I just run around doing this to people. It's like, I cast knife! It's super effective. Also, wow, these guys are shredded. Like, god, that I could look so good after being an emaciated zombie for thousands of years. Anyway, time for the first boss. Which is tough enough that it's turned some people off the game, which is strange to me personally, but then I am very good at video games. Especially when you're playing as the sorcerer. So I was saying earlier that um, the Sorcerer is kind of easy mode, and I think that's legitimately the case, because... Well, I say that and then I get smashed to bits, but uh, there's ironic applause in the background. Um, yeah, but so, the thing about the Sorcerer is that um, you're a glass cannon and it's not that difficult. Yeah, hi Mavrinthia, nice to see you. I am in fact alive. Uh, the uh, reports of my death were in fact greatly exaggerated. A quote that I just came up with right now and I can be completely credited for. So, what the fuck was I saying? Oh right, yeah. Uh, so the sorcerer is a glass cannon, but um, the thing is its damage output is so strong and the fact that you can do it at a bigger range than anybody else except the hunter who starts with a bow, but the bow's damage is way less. Means that you can basically kill stuff without having to get into danger range pretty easily from the start. Um, I will continue talking about this once we get to the starting area of the game after this cutscene. Only in the ancient legends it is stated that one day an undead shall be chosen. to leave the undead asylum in pilgrimage to the land of the ancient lords. Lordran.
there will definitely be some stuff to say later on about why it's important that that is a a crow that is dropping you off over here. Um, but that can wait until I start talking about mythic import and all of these other important things about why things are the way they are and why this place is the way it is. But first, we've got to talk to this guy. Well, what do we have here? You must be a new arrival. Let me guess. Fate of the undead, right? Well, you're not the first. But there's no salvation here. You'd have done better to rot in the undead asylum. But too late now. <sighs> well, since you're here, let me help you out. There are actually two bells of awakening. One's up above in the undead church. The other is far, far below in the ruins at the base of Blight Town. Ring them both, and something happened. Brilliant, right? Not much to go on, but I have a feeling that won't stop you. So, off you go. It is why you came, isn't it? To this accursed land of the undead? <laughs> it's kind of fun that people just assume that you know what you're doing or why you're doing it. Part of the experience of Dark Souls is not really understanding why you're doing any of the things you're doing, which is part of <laughs> the thematic arc of the game, as that eventually betrays you. Um, but I also want to point out, while we're at it, that uh, none of the NPCs in this game have mouth flaps. You're practically hollow. But who knows? Going hollow could solve quite a bit. <laughs> I think he looks like Sean Bean, actually. He's got that kind of dour Yorkshire Yorkshireman attitude to him. So this is Firelink Shrine, the... Uh, basic game hub which we will be returning to throughout the game. It is sort of set into the base of a giant tree and um, much like a tree the branches of the paths through this world gnarl around and back again, always leading back to this same place. Like roots coiling through soil. This is a guy everybody hates because he's got a stupid Hello. haircut. I believe we are not acquainted. I am Petrus of Thoroughland. Have you business with us? If not, I'd prefer to keep a distance, if possible. Hello there. I realize that I have requested that we retain our distance. But I also want you to know that it is not meant in ill will. Here, take this as a token of peace. No, go ahead. It's for you. So, he basically just pays you a copper coin to fuck off, which, um is one of the reasons I don't like him. You can go back and talk to him and he will agree to teach you miracles. He is the basic faith trainer in the game, which, um, again, in this game, sort of ironic subversive slant on, well, not subversive or ironic really, but just like dark takes on um, fantasy tropes. He is very much not a good person, as we will find out eventually. But um, yeah, the thing is that like, there's a big difference between a remaster and a remake, even though people keep conflating the two and calling them by the other, which is really irritating, especially in marketing material, but this is kind of, for me, the gold standard of a of a remaster. It, this is what Dark Souls looks like in my, you know, in my mind's eye when I think about it. And then I go back and actually play the original game and it looks like, it looks, it looks like dog shit. It's awful. Um, it is just not, uh, it, it does not stand up really, the graphics in that game anymore. But, they've changed almost nothing else. Ah, skeleton time. So, one of the things about Dark Souls is starting in Firelink Shrine, starting to explore, finding the only obvious way to explore to be go, to go over here to the graveyard, and then just getting absolutely bodied by skeletons, because they're actually really tough. Um, well, they're not that tough. If you know what you're doing, it's quite easy to fight the starting skeletons, but the sorcerer is not really equipped for it. They have decent magic resistance. It takes quite a few soul arrows to kill them. Um, so this is what I do, because I'm terrible. If you want to clear them out so you can loot the graveyard, which I do for assorted reasons, there's this convenient big hole that they will inevitably fall down. Actually, how much damage will I output with my soul arrow right now? 
Yeah, see, it's uh, take a few hits to knock one down. Bye. <laughs> yeah, speaking of all the same bugs, it's very much the case that skeletons you're trying to get to chase you off a cliff will periodically get stuck on the top of the staircase and just get trapped in a run cycle forever. Because it's Dark Souls. And um, Dark Souls is fundamentally all about getting trapped in cycles forever. You see, even the bugs fit the thematic uh, basis of the game. That's how you know it's truly a masterpiece. But yeah, so what I used to do when I was, when this was my comfort game, when I was very, very depressed, and I spent like two years just playing through it over and over and over, what I would do is I would sprint through the entire graveyard, wake up every skeleton and have them all chase me in this sort of like astonishing Harryhausen cavalcade. Um, and then all of them would just pitch off the edge of that cliff, one by one. I have failed to catch both of these guys, but that's fine. Off you go. Getting things to throw themselves off cliffs is actually a really useful skill if you want to play, um, Dark Souls in general. Hey, I never get grumpy, that's extremely rude. So, yeah. Oh, I was talking about why... Oh, he, look, see, he's got stuck on the staircase. It's really consistent, like, one in every three skeletons gets stuck. Come on now. Skeletons are disproportionately easy to get off cliffs because they have such, um... Like, they, ha they have a lot of forward jumps and a lot of fairly ridiculous looking, kind of, jumpy, rolly lashy outy attacks, which means that <laughs> they move around a lot. Uh, the willingness of the developers to have attack animations or just general like AI behaviors that actually let them move around a lot, it results in a lot of buggy behavior, but it actually um, is a testament to how robust and well designed this game is. That generally speaking, it still works. This is clearest in, um, oh shit. You live by the skeleton, you die by the skeleton. Well. You live by the falling off a cliff, you die by the falling off a cliff. But so, um, I like to play through the game as human as possible for as long as possible, but there's a reason why I haven't done that, uh, why I haven't turned myself human yet, and it's because I might die while doing the graveyard. That means that all of those skeletons will have respawned, so instead of fighting them all again, well, instead of tricking them all into falling off the cliff again, I'm just going to go rather than, you know, um, wasting everyone's time. So it is a good it is a good skill for dealing with real life problems actually. Uh, I definitely have thrown multiple problems off a cliff. Don't tell the police. So there's a few more items to pick up here in Firelink Shrine. I would like to clear out the graveyard and grab a few items, but I'm going to come back when I have more powerful spells because I just I can't be bothered to fight them properly, even though it's faster and um, like it's faster. But if you die, you have to start over, which is a lot slower. So. Anyway, um, so the, the character most people recommend you start the game with if you've never played a Souls game before is the Pyromancer, which might sound odd considering I was talking about um, the Sorcerer as being easy mode. The thing is, Sorcerer is easy mode if you know what you're doing. And yes, Icarus, I did notice earlier when you said that the, um, uh, the Master Key is the real easy mode. It is the real easy mode. Um, but only if you really know what you're doing. Like, if you have enough knowledge about the game to know how to use it, it's very effective. But the Pyromancer is generally recommended for new players because it is the best all-rounder, I think, as a starting class. You have limited but powerful backup magic to, you know, deal some damage output at a slight range. But most of the time you're still running around doing melee stuff, and unlike the Sorcerer, it can actually hold its own in melee. You know, you start with um, a decent shield, and do you start with a shield? I don't remember. You start with a decent axe, at any rate, and some decent armour, so you're actually able to sort of engage with all aspects of the game. You can invest in melee because um, pyromancy does not require a stat investment. The only thing that affects pyromancy is how much money you've invested into your pyromancy play. Incidentally, this is where we'll be going a lot later in the game, but I'm just coming down here to play a spell real quick. Well, I shouldn't cry. 
I'm Ricky Vinheim. I was once an established smith, but look at me now. Can you believe it? I love this guy because unlike most of the NPCs, he never really does anything or moves around. He's a merchant, even though he's got a lot more lines than most of the merchants, and so he'll just sit in his in his nice safe hidey hole forever. Hmm? What is it? So the different uh, smiths in the game all have different um, specialties, which is why it matters that he's sort of here. Uh, we're coming back and getting heavy soul arrow a bit later, but smithing helps soothe my nerves. Don't let me wither away our life. Well, he clearly got in there on purpose, so like being behind bars doesn't necessarily mean he can't get out. Um, but yeah, so the pyromancer is a really good all rounder. Um, like you're you're decent enough in melee. This is this is where you would use the key for easy mode if you do have the key. Um, it's a good all rounder. It you know the pyromancer will get you out of trouble. It is as you said very satisfying the way that you sort of there's a real there's a real weight to the animations of pyromancy as compared to sorcery. Which I think is fitting because of the way that these things are are described in in the world in the setting. Um, there's something about manipulating and forcing out a primal force that is not the same as sort of like projecting your soul at people. But uh, yeah, by comparison, the sorcerer's damage output has greater range and is just much bigger in general. Um, for instance, a soul arrow right now with my stats unupgraded, I think will kill the basic hollows we're about to go fight in one hit, assuming they don't block. Um, oh, also, continuing a theme of people in cages. This poor woman has had her tongue cut out, therefore there's no point talking to her right now. So, yeah, um, that's why the, the sorcerer is the sort of general easy mode. If you start as the sorcerer, you can basically just blast your way through the first couple of bosses without even trying. Yeah, there are a lot of dragon. There's a lot of dungeons. There's technically only two dragons, though. Um, there's several drakes, which is a meaningful distinction that itself is not a meaningful distinction, which is something that I talk about at length <laughs> in various different places. Um, but whether or not it should be meaningful that something is a dragon or not. But yeah, so if I hit this guy, he should go down in one hit. And that's why uh, starting as the sorcerer is the most powerful option. Because you can just blast them from a distance. Um, I tend to try and save my soul sorceries, even though I don't... Oh, I forgot to attune my new sorcery. Oh, well, that's fine. But yeah, so we will be, we will be relying on... Um, Carrying to start with, just to save on soul arrows. One of the curious things about Dark Souls 1 is that um, it compares interestingly to Dark Souls 2 and 3 in that there's a lot of systems that were changed in Dark Souls 1 that were then changed back for Dark Souls 2 and remain changed for the rest of the series. And one of these is attunements and magic. There's no mana system in the game. You have a specific number of casts per spell. And you can equip multiple copies of that spell to get more casts. I will probably stop talking every time I need to focus. <laughs> but, um... <clears throat> Actually, that's a good question. I think it's reasonable to assume that a lot of the undead dragons are... Actually, no, we know that the undead dragons are actual proper dragons, the, you know, the, the everlasting dragons and their immediate descendants, because um, the, like, dragon butts, the, like, back halves of the zombie dragons that you find very late in the game. Oh, whoa! Okay. So here's a fun fact. Um, in Dark Souls 1, you use the same button to roll, to hop backwards, and to sprint. So, I'm not going to waste any more humanity by turning myself human again. 
but <laughs> that's what happened there. I was trying to jump back across. You can only jump if you're sprinting, and um, to sprint you need to hold B while moving forwards. Oh, the huge manatee. Oh, hey. That was a weird jump attack, my guy. Oh, yeah, the spell. Thanks for reminding me. So, um, yeah, I need to... Actually, the other reason why the sorcerer is um, easy mode, as compared to the pyromancer, is that the sorcerer does magic damage and the pyromancer does fire damage. Um, things are more resistant to fire, generally, I've found. Like, elemental resistances are always very effective um, in the early game. Well, doing elemental damage because things don't have much in the way of elemental resistances is very effective in the early game. And um, the thing is, I think magic is the second least common resistance. So it's generally just easier to do loads of damage via magic damage. Which is also a contributing factor to why the Master Key is a very effective um, easy mode option. Because the Master Key, the benefit is that if you go to that place I pointed out earlier, you can open that gate early. And um, on the other side, there is a zombie dragon guarding a sword. That sword is very easy to wield. Uh, the main limiting factor is that it requires 14 faith. But uh, most classes start with around 10 faith, so it's quite easy to get, put a couple points in there in the early game. So at that point, you have this sword. What does the sword do? Well, it does around 100 physical damage, which is decent, and it also does around 100 magical damage. Which means that not only is its like raw damage output twice as much as anything else you might be wielding at this stage of the game, half of that damage is going to be resisted way less. Um, and it even has a good moveset. I think it shares the basic longsword moveset. So it's got some sweeps and some stabs. And honestly, you can beat this game um, just using a basic longsword from the early area if you upgrade it as you go. Uh, let's... No, that's hardly fair, is it? There's two of you, there's only one of me. I love the kind of, like, back alley mob murder attitude that... Um, killing someone with the <laughs> with the dagger has. Just, you know, flailing until there's not much left of them. Just absolutely cheese grater a man to death. I remember when I first started playing this, it took me a lot to figure out. Um... Oh, I hope you go through the wall. Oh well. It took me a lot to figure out uh, how to access some of these areas down here. One of the things Dark Souls teaches you is to be very observant of your environment and um, just keep an eye out for hints that areas are accessible, also. Well, 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 it's a stealth hollowed angle party. Which is, for anyone who doesn't know, a reference to the episode of my Let's Play seven years ago where I went through this area. Um, oh my god, it's been a while. So these guys don't aggro until you get halfway through the room, so you can just knock two of them down right at the start. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, again, see, like, all of the items in the game are on corpses, which may or may not mean something. The uh, director of the game has, is, has explicitly said in interviews that, like, this is a game that is designed, and a world that is designed, to encourage people to put things together and come up with their own conclusions. There is no objective truth, there's just a whole lot of weird evocative things that you're supposed to put together in your own brain. Also, some stuff clearly just died, and I don't know why. I was I gained twenty souls off of those uh, little deaths, so it must have been ordinary, basic crappy hollows those guys I just killed. But um, I'm not sure why they fell. Anyway, so the areas in Dark Souls are very carefully designed to encourage you to learn to observe your environment and figure out things. Why is that there? Surely, you know that interior space would not exist if it wasn't accessible for a reason. But this has a curious te oh, by the way, dragon. Or drake, you know, don't at me. Um, so part of it is that, you know, you if you watch, you can see, oh, there's, there's a balcony over there with some barrels on it. That might be accessible. Um, but so the 
kind of the tension it has is that it also has this strong desire to present places that feel like they might have been real places that were actually lived in by people at some point. Um, ouch. <laughs> oh, the other, th the other benefit to doing uh, magic damage is that um, most shields only have a partial block for magic damage. Alright. You know, crossbows are invented to deal with the problem of wizards getting too uppity. These guys are called hollows, but they're apparently smart enough to still know, to ha know how to use potions. So, uh, yeah, what the hell was I saying? Uh, I don't remember. Oh, no, level design. <laughs> So yeah, one of the one of the ways it's designed is to encourage you to observe these spaces and see, oh look, there's a, a passageway through there, and there's Oh, I was misaligned for the parry and repost there. Oh yeah, also the sort of impact and damage of a soul arrow is enough to, to break these guys' guard quite quickly, which means that you can also uh, get damaged through that way. But yeah, most shields are not very resistant to magic damage. To the point where there's a couple of shields in the game that point out they're resistant to magic damage because it's unusual. But I'm never going to get tired of the mental image of this like back alley wizard just shiving people in the kidneys because that's more effective than casting spells at them. Well now, you seem to have your wits about you. Hmm? Then you are a welcome customer. I trade for souls. Everything's for sale. <laughs> That's, what is that, like, creepy Dark Souls laugh number three now? They're an absolute serious institution. Things are getting treacherous in these parts. A horrible goat demon has moved in below. And up above, there's that humongous drake and a bull demon too. If you stick around this place, it might end up being your grave. <laughs> so he's just told us about, um... An optional mini-boss and the next two bosses, the first boss of the game and then the first real boss of the game. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love how nasal he is. It's really unusual to hear someone so aggressively, like, unpleasant in their, like, just their voice. I am going to buy the Orange Guidance Soapstone so that we can leave messages and write messages, which is something I always forget to do when I play these games, even though it's such a key and important part of them. And then later we're going to have to come back and get the bottomless box because it's just Thank really useful. <laughs> also, uh, this guy is super murderable. Like, he's incredibly murderable. He stands there, so if you go behind him and stab, you can get a backstab really easily. Um, at which point he will pull out a unique katana, which uh, is one of the other sort of e easy access, early game, powerful weapons. You have the Astora Straight Sword, which I mentioned earlier as being accessible with the Master Key. You have a couple of other things, and you have that guy's katana. Oh yeah, it's funny you should mention his tub, because um, when you kill him, if you decide to murder him for his sword, uh, his last word is, um, he yells out a woman's name, and I'm not sure, I can't remember what the name is. You'd think I'd, uh, you'd think, you know, I've played 300 hours of this game, you'd think I'd remember, but no. So, um... Yeah. Yulia. That's what he yells. He yells Yulia. So some people have theorised that his, his tub is in fact Yulia. Uh, the more likely thought, if you ask me, is that it's the name of the sword. People also think it might be the name of the female undead merchant that we can meet later. Yeah, definitely. His, um, his, his favourite, uh, you know, animated tapestry girl from, uh, you know, who plays puppet shows really, really skillfully, like, gets 360 no scopes with them. <coughs> so, yeah, um, I think I missed an item actually. So, yeah, this, uh, this first zone of the game is an introduction to a variety of, um, Things that will be relevant, but this this level design thing I keep going on about is important. Uh, did I get it? I did not. Haha. -ha. Yes. So, as you can see, these these areas in the game are incredibly um, tangled and layered and like overlapping. It's um, it's like a, a complicated web of vines. Um, 
well, you know, video games are a high art form, but they're also pop cultural entertainment, which is why I th like to do literary criticism to them, because they don't generally receive that. Even, like, arch, oh, games are art type art critics, or games critics, rather, don't really seem to actually be interested in critiquing them as works of art. Um, and when they do so, they're almost entirely focused on the visual, rather than, in a more filmic manner, the combination of the visual with the sort of thematic and the narrative and all of these different things. The Marvel Universe already happened to games as an art form. That's kind of... <laughs> that's kind of where they were for, like, 20 years. So, um, yeah, we've cleaned out this entire area now, there's nothing left, but as I said, that you can see, you know, hints that you can get through places. You can see there's a walkway there, and you could see the balcony on the other side, so you could maybe theorise that there's a way to get in there, and then you find it hidden under the boxes. Similarly, that item I went back for, the guy's leaning out of the window, and, um... That thing, uh... It haunted me. Just give me one moment. <clears throat> so yeah, um, I was just I was just haunted for a really long time by that guy dangling out the window. I could not figure out how to find him, but he's visible from a few other places in the level, so I knew there was an item there. So I knew there had to be an accessible area there, and I could not figure it out. It was on something like my fourth playthrough of the game. I finally found how to get onto that into that little room, and at that point I was just astonished by my own foolishness. You know, it was right here the whole time. You know, you just had to. Look behind you. What is rule one of exploring in Dark Souls? You just, uh... You look behind stuff, you look around. Actually, the original Deus Ex has been on my list of games to Let's Play for basically since I started. It's one of my favourite games of all time, so I will not hear you speak negatively about it. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, so... This is another thing that catches new players unawares. These guys, um, just start throwing fireballs on here. But, um... They tend not to be able to hit you, and this is the real risk, is that they encourage you to sprint past them and get into this room, whereupon there are three guys waiting to ambush you. So I have a fun anecdote about this room, by which I mean an incredibly salty anecdote from like two days ago. Um, which is that I started this, uh, I, I played through the game, I got up here, I was feeling pretty good about my, my run, and... Um, <clears throat> When I was uh, way over there on the other side of that bridge, I, I saw a phantom spawn in, a red phantom, which for anyone who hasn't played Dark Souls, is another player attempting to invade my game world, because Dark Souls kind of pioneered this sort of passive multiplayer thing. It's actually implemented in a lot more ways than people tend to remember in, uh, in the game, but the most common way is that you can leave a sign uh, and other players can summon you to help them, or you can intentionally invade their world and try and kill them and take their resources. Yeah, like, um, I honestly, I tend to, like, I love wizards. Wizards are fucking great. Um, just fucking, like, you know, a sorcerer with beams of power crackling from between his fingertips. That is absolutely my jam. However, I will always have a soft spot for, you know, the, the hopeless swordsman charging one down. And traditionally, that's the counter, you know, the swordsman is supposed to be able to defeat the sorcerer. Um in that manner, by just charging them down and stopping them. Also, these guys are good to loot normally, but <laughs> it's so difficult not to knock them off if you aren't using an item, uh, a weapon that will just kill them really quickly. Oh, I saw a vagrant one time, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I'm a sorcerer, by the way. Um, for assorted reasons. A source to reasons, which is that mostly people would watch people do melee runs, and I thought it might be fun to do a sorcery run. That item down there is another hint that you can, you know, find other paths through the level with other stuff in them. But yeah, so vagrants are a re one of the really, they are the least common and weirdest passive multiplayer elements. So, um, as I was saying, Dark Souls likes to weave its sort of themes and concepts directly into its mechanics, which is why you have you know, things respawn at bonfires, and that's sort of a, a known part of, of the world, that, like, people know that the undead come back to life at these strange bonfires, but, um... Oh, I lost, uh, lost targeting, that's a shame. 
So, um, yeah, the most common way is that people will invade you and try and take your stuff. Fair enough, it's a mechanic in the game, that's fine. Less common are things like uh, when you are in one of these zones that have the two bells you need to activate for the plot, uh, you can hear a bell ringing in the distance sometimes. What that means is that another player who is in your orbit, because it has this sort of complicated system where players drift, like, it's essentially, effectively, you're sort of randomly put into and then out of different servers with different groups of players. It sort of randomly assigns and reassigns people. Oh yeah. But the way, um, the way it works in effect is drifting into one another. You see those white phantoms running around occasionally? Those sort of transparent ghost guys? Those are an example of the passive multiplayer. Those are other players running around in their own worlds, uninteractively. Then there's the bloodstains, which show you how other players died, which I never bother to watch because I know every inch of this game is <laughs> just, you know, floor to ceiling. And, um, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of these things. Occasionally, if someone ignites a bonfire, you get, you gain a little extra use of your healing potion, which is very useful. So this is the first mini boss. They kind of become normally normal enemies by the end of the game, but this is a black knight. Um, what the hell was I talking about? Right, so uh, vagrants are this thing where if players drop enough items um, in a level and they despawn, those items will eventually sort of clump together into a weird entity called a vagrant, which is then this like little orby, glowy, gloopy, spidery looking thing, which will run around inside other players' games. Uh, and if they find it and kill it, they get whatever items it had in it. And, um... Oh really? Which edge do you knock him off? I've always used this as, as my cheese option. Um, well, I mean, if I'm playing a melee build, I just fight him fair, because it's not that difficult, but... Um, or I just, like, repeatedly drop on his head from here, which is funny. But this is my usual preferred cheese option. There aren't too many ledges to get him off of around here. You mean back near the bonfire, or do you mean the one opposite where he is? Uh, where he starts. There we go, a completely unfair way to defeat someone. Okay, yeah, I know exactly where you mean. Um, it never occurred to me to try and bait him off that. Normally because when I try and bait people off things, I fall off myself, as was evidenced earlier. So, I think... Right, there's just the blue tear stone ring to go grab, which is what he's guarding. I suppose he's not guarding it. Maybe he slew this guy. Because he's got his back to you. If he was guarding it, he'd be looking the other way. So again, all of these place, all of these areas are areas we can go. That area down there is part of the level that we will get to later. The fact that people leave messages fucking everywhere uh, is a good hint that you can get to places. If you can see messages somewhere, someone made it there, therefore that's not just back like a backdrop to the level. Um, most of the zones in the game, if you can see a place, you can probably go there. And this is the drop that Rathorius was mentioning. So in, in the original Dark Souls, I spent ages uh, convinced there was a way to get in there for exactly this reason. This was the tension I mentioned earlier between these two like desires for level design. They wanted to seem like a real place. Um, but also they teach you that you can, if you can observe a place, you can probably get to it somehow. So... Uh, yeah. Oh, that's right. I did actually... Uh, like, my proudest Dark Souls story is that I did actually see a um, a vagrant in the original Dark Souls. Uh, when I was playing through it, I think on my very first run, I saw this weird, like, squiggly little jellyfish spider thing. And I chased it down and I got a bunch of... I can't remember what it was. Probably dung pies or something. Get back here, you. So for anyone who doesn't know, this is a crystal lizard. You can find them hidden throughout the game. If you catch them and kill them, they give good upgrade materials, which we will be using later. Yeah, exactly. That's it. That's what I did. I tried to jump between those, and I always failed. So this boss is really easy. Um, it's basically just another tutorial, really. They are magic turtles. That's right. I forgot about that. I should probably switch to a better shield by this point. I keep meaning to and I keep forgetting. Lighter shields are better for parrying. They have better parry windows. Um, 
but heavier shields have better block. Do I even have any other shield? Oh, I did get the Caduceus. Oh, and the and the wooden shield, which are both better for blocking. Um, I was talking about this earlier. The, one of the things I really appreciate is that this is a remaster of the style that I consider a remaster rather than a remake. People, marketing teams seem to just pick, pick whichever word they think sounds better, but uh, a remake, I think, has wide changes, whereas a remaster is basically just making it look as good as you remember it looking. This is solidly a remaster. There are very few changes to the game. They have added one bonfire, which is actually a negative change in my opinion. It turns that whole area into a weird trap, which I will talk about later. Um, but other than that, there's almost no gameplay changes. There's a bunch of multiplayer changes, but um, in terms of places to do things to see, people to do this to, uh, there's very little. It's really just there is a new bonfire and the um, preserved finger item, I can't remember what it's called properly, um, is now bought from a merchant instead of found. So as I was saying, Sorcerer will just let you kind of die terribly. Oh, that's embarrassing. I didn't even take a single hit when I fought this guy earlier. But this is that thing I'm always saying. I never think to myself when I'm playing casually, like, oh, you know, game harder when talk. But you know what? Game harder when talk. See, I don't lure him up onto the tower because I actually find him harder to fight up, of there, up there. And honestly, he's so easy to fight that I never need to. Um, like, not just if you're a sorcerer, he's really easy to kill. Well, it's easy to kill again. Oh fuck. Oh no. Ah. It's very important that I not die. This is just a general rule for life, but also, um, if I can get back to my bloodstain, it had some humanity in it. I'd rather not lose that. I've never been able to actually target those guys with the lock on from here before. I don't know if some ranges were changed, um, or if we just got lucky or whatever. Is the axe guy here? No. Oh yeah, it's hilarious when you get him to backstep off the edge of that wall. That is my favourite way to beat him, but it's it's inconsistent to provoke. You don't need to kill this guy, but um, there's a handful of hollows who have a habit of uh, aggroing and chasing you while you're trying to do other things, which I find incredibly tedious. Oh, that's right, I was telling an anecdote and then I forgot all about it. So, um, I came through this area, there was a there was a guy. Um, so, he disappeared and ran away, essentially. And I was like, okay, red spirits do that though so that they can ambush you sometimes. Fair enough, someone's playing hard to get. And then, um, so I continued on, I killed some stuff. And then I went into that room with the, the, the axe guy on the other side of the, the, the bridge that those guys bomb. And um, immediately died. And as the camera span around to reveal what had killed me, it turned out that a guy in endgame armor, um, wearing a set that is one of these like horribly min-maxed, like theory crafted, you know, if you build this exact specific build, then you can wield these specific items in a specific way, and it's mathematically the most possible damage you can get out of a certain like style of play. Um, he had hidden in the corner between, like, the doorway and, um, come in, so it was impossible to see him running into the room. And then he immediately shot me in the back with a sorcery that, um, filled the entire room and was therefore impossible to dodge. And, um, killed me in one hit. <sighs> and then he walked out and did ironic emotes at me as I lay dying. So, um, I hope that guy's having fun playing whatever the fuck game he's playing, because it's clearly not Dark Souls. And, like, people who want to troll players like that, I can understand it vaguely. I don't like it, and I don't agree with it, but, you know, I don't care. I've been killed by phantoms hundreds of times. I'm not great at the PvP, like, um... What I don't like is that someone's first experience of this game might be, you know, struggling through the early areas of the game, because people do struggle with it. 
I don't, I say, having been murdered by the first real- well, having been murdered by the first non-tutorial boss <laughs> after talking about how easy he was to kill. Um, but people do struggle with this stuff, and I think it's just- it's a bad experience if you struggle all the way through there and then some dipshit kills you with something you could never have possibly predicted or understood in an incredibly unfair way. But yeah, this guy goes down pretty easy. If you have a decent melee weapon, especially if you buff it, um, you can just, like, take him out pretty easily. I think that I will just institute a rule across the board that I'm not going to talk during boss fights, even easy ones. So yeah, uh, as I said, if you're not um, if you're not uh, being distracted by trying to talk at the same time, incredibly easy boss. Like I usually don't take a hit while fighting him, even when I'm playing a melee build. Like it's not it's not difficult. Yeah, that's another change. Um, I was mentioning previously that um, Dark Souls One made a lot of changes to the formula, and because most people come to the series with Dark Souls One or, or did, went because it was what really made it popular. You know, a lot fewer people played Demon Souls. Um, people then saw the change back to the way it had been in Demon Souls for Dark Souls two and three as this kind of like change to the formula. But actually, Dark Souls is the one that's um, it's an outsider. It's it's the one that that breaks from the tradition in that it is. You know, there's all these odd changes like the the thing about having um, numbers of casts per equip rather than having a mana system. And uh, not having to spend stamina to cast, uh, leveling up at any bonfire instead of one specific NPC, and so on and so forth. I love skyboxes, and I just want to point out that this is a gorgeous one. This is a significant upgrade from the already really pretty skybox in, in the base game, in the original game. And um, I think there's a definite thematic component to the fact that in this, a search for, um, you know what is ultimately a search for divinity, a search for the sun. Um, and here we have Soler himself very explicitly searching for the sun, searching for divinity. Um, here we see him staring up at it, but it's behind the clouds, it's not visible. This is approaching the sunset of the world. Ah, hello. You don't look hollow, far from it. I am Soler of Astora, an adherent of the Lord of Sunlight. Now that I am undead, I have come to this great land, the birthplace of Lord Gwyn, to seek my very own son. Do you find that strange? Well, no need to hide your reaction. I get that look all the time. <laughs> also, I would have assumed that Beasted was a pun if you hadn't pointed out that you hadn't intended it as one, so I think you should just go with your confidence. Oh, aha. So I didn't scare you. I have a proposition, if you have a moment. I think that they may have updated his model a little bit too much. I think he looks hench now. The way I see it, our fate appears to be intertwined. In a land brimming with hollows, could that really be mere chance? So what do you say? Why not help one another on this lonely journey? This pleases me greatly. Well then, take this. Like, Soler always looked kind of schlubby in the original game. <laughs> so it was really amusing to me uh, this morning, walking walking up on him from behind and just seeing, oh wow, he looks he looks built now. We are like strange beings in a strange land. The flow of time itself is convoluted, with heroes centuries old phasing in and out. The very fabric wavers, and relations shift and obscure. There's no telling how much longer your world and mine will remain in contact. But use this, 
to summon one another as spirits, cross the gaps between the worlds, and engage in jolly cooperation. Jolly of course, cooperation, he said the meme. But I am a warrior of the sun. Spot my summon signature easily by its brilliant aura. If you miss it, you must be blind. <laughs> He's been working out all quarantine. Also, I will never get over the fact that his voice is slightly muffled. They actually added that, like, they've added that muffle to the audio track because he's wearing a helmet. Is that not delightful? This is a game where they thought about that level of detail. Characters wearing helmets sound muffled. Oh, hello there. I will stay behind to gaze at the sun. The sun is a wondrous body, like a magnificent father. If only I could be so grossly incandescent. Ah yes, the magnificent body of Daddy Sun. So, uh, yeah, we now have learned about how multiplayer works. So he exists here in this place to essentially teach you, the player, about both the sort of one of the sort of recurring themes in the game, which is this idea of um, the cycle of reality ending, which is represented by the world fading away, different places, different times fading into one another as the expanse of the world reduces itself back down. But this also explicitly tells you the way the multiplayer works. It's people fading in and out of, um, you know, different things. So I should mention, actually, Jirin, these... Oh, you got me desserts, thank you. Um, so I should... <laughs> That's my flatmate, in case you're wondering. Um, I should mention that, like, in my Let's Play on YouTube five years ago, I went into a vast amount of detail on lore and theories and themes and all of that kind of stuff. I don't particularly want to retread that ground, so I'm going to ramble about it as and when it comes up in my brain while I'm streaming this, but I'm not going to go on lengthy diatribes about the way things work and mythic import and significance and the way that souls represent the impact you have on a world and all of this kind of different stuff. Um, I'll ramble about it when I bring it when it comes up, but I'm not going to uh, extensively go on about it right now. So. Um, it's worth noting that this door is openable. This is, we'll have to come back here later. Um, but I will talk about that when it comes up, about why that's interesting and slightly frustrating. For now, I need to fucking sprint. Um, as someone who doesn't run a lot in real life, for various reasons, um, assorted disabilities being all of them, <laughs> I actually loved running. I used to love running so much when I was uh, when I was a kid, and I just my my body slowly disintegrated, so I wasn't able to anymore. I should become a human while I'm here. Right, uh, let's drop in here and spend some humanity to Detroit to become human. Incidentally, uh. I, this is this is again one of these things I talk for literally hours about in my long ass let's play of this game, but um, this desire to represent thematic, um, well, physical concepts within the world or metaphysical concepts within the world that serve a thematic purpose as part of this story about cycles and death and ending and the concept of despair. Uh, despair. Um, they all seem to have a bit of tension where they attempt to try and, try, kind of try and actually tie it to uh, mechanics in the game. They want this stuff all to blend together in a complicated way, and I think that's an admirable goal, but it is kind of obvious when, you know, to the people in this world, hollowing is not a binary state. You are not a human or a hollow. Hollowing is a slow process, whoa, bye, uh, that happens over a long period of time as you lose your despair and your humanity and you become more and more mindless until you become one of these wandering hollows who can't really move or do anything. There we go. Uh, I don't know what that meant. I'm pretty sure that noise means a new follower, but my follower count hasn't got, gone up, so who knows. Um, anyway, as a, as a brief digression, this, uh, this rat hole here is actually one of the... Dark Souls is a very fair game, but it is also a cruel game. Um... The number of times people try get stuck trying to cross this bridge, not realizing you're supposed to run down here. Um, and then you finally get over here and um, those rats will ambush you and knock you off. If you try and fight them properly, they will poison you. Um, 
it's very much a game that requires you to come to it with this sense of paranoia, which again ties into the themes of the game and this kind of like this constant grinding pressure against you to try and force you to give up. Because you don't lose Dark Souls when you die, you respawn at a bonfire. You never lose when you die. Dying is just part of the learning experience. You lose when you give up. You lose when you give in to despair. Also, quick note, do you see that at the back? There's a portcullis that's currently open. Um, a lot of people don't notice this, but there's actually one of these, one of these shitty hollow men runs through and shuts the gate from the other side. If you can kill him fast enough, which you can do if you specialized, um, oh, if there's two of them, I'm not really going to try and parry because that's a bit difficult when there's two at once. Okay. The fuck was I talking about? Um, yeah, so he, he runs through and shuts that gate and then you have to open it from the other side. People don't realize that gate's not shut from the start. Like he does actually run through and do stuff. And this is kind of part of a thing about like, just sort of letting you know that like stuff that happens in the world stays happened regardless of you coming back at a bonfire and everybody else coming back when you rest at a bonfire. Ouch. And, but yeah, so hollowing is kind of like a tension with regards to that stuff because it's, it's treated very much as a binary process in the game. You're either hollowed or you're not. Um, but to the people in the world, it is this slow, slow process um, that can be reversed or changed or is really more about vibes than anything else. Um, which means that you get a lot of people doing this thing, not to climb back up on my soapbox, um, but like my regular soapbox when I am playing games is very much that People take everything literally. People take everything so fucking literally all of the time. And um, no, actually, sometimes things are ambiguous. Sometimes people in the world are incorrect or confused or just straight up things are different for one person than for another person. There is this very kind of binarist concept just across the board in people consuming media that if someone says this, it must mean this thing. And um, yeah, I disagree with that in general love to get stuck on a pig. So uh, the giant armoured boar I'm going to fight in a minute. Um, are you stuck or are you coming? Here we go. Ah yeah, see that bell is what I was mentioning previously. That means that another player has just successfully beaten the Belfry Gargoyles and rung their bell. Which sounds like a euphemism, but isn't. There's also this odd trend in the game of introducing mechanics that you use once and then never use again, even though it's built as a mechanical thing rather than as a just like a one-off set piece or whatever. This is, I think, one, one of maybe two places in the game where you can find alluring skulls as an item. Um, and all of the item drops in, oh, fuck, in Dark Souls are fixed. They don't um, change or reset or whatever between different plays. They aren't randomised. If you find find something here, you'll find it here the same time next time. And uh, yeah, so the alluring skull is an item you can throw and certain enemies, very specific number of types of enemies, will be drawn to it. So you can throw a alluring skull in the fire, the big monster goes in the fire and dies. Um, that is not a mechanic you ever need to use. That is not a mechanic you need to use here. You can fight it fair, you can backstab it pretty easily, which I probably should have done to show you off the rather unpleasant animation of you, you know, putting your knife elbow deep up a giant boar's anus. Um, but that's Dark Souls. So what the fuck was I talking about? Um, yeah, these weird mechanics. So this, there aren't very many other places in the game where this sort of thing happens, but like, yeah, they just, you can find those, you can use them there if you're clever, you can use it to lure the thing into the fire, or you can just rodeo it into the fire by dodging out the way, or you can fight it properly, or you can backstab it, or any of these other things. And, um, it's just, you never need to use that. I find myself... That's the only place in the game I ever use the Alluring Skulls. There's various stuff you can do with it at other points in the game if you want to, but it's almost never more effective than just fighting something. 
that boar is one of the only times it's more effective to use alluring skulls, because often if you throw it right, it gets stuck on the scenery and just sits in the fire until it dies, which is something we can all identify with. Um, but if not, then it's like... Why do we have these? It's like you've got four of them and you'll use two or three of them here and then just have a couple in your inventory for the rest of the game for no reason. Um, I always wonder about that sort of thing. Also, this is notable. I go on like a 10 minute like lecture about this in my Let's Play, but um, this is one of the only corpses in the game that has armor on. Almost every corpse you find is completely naked or wearing rags. Um, there's maybe two, three in the game that are actually wearing armor, and that is one of them. So I guess, you know, his armor clearly didn't save him from whatever horrible fate befell him. Speaking of horrible fates befalling people, I do feel like there's a kind of a... There's a sort of a tonal connection between Dark Souls and, um... Legend of Zelda, uh, Majora's Mask. And I'm not just saying that because a horrible fate has befallen you is a line from that. Although, you know, a horrible fa fate has befallen this guy as I just really get that knife in there. Just really stick it up on in there. So this is the first Balder Knight we'll fight. Um, Balder Knights are a huge pain in the ass because they're a major difficulty jump from the... Um... Actually, uh, no, I don't believe it. Oh, actually, now that you mention it, yeah, I've never noticed that before. But that corpse was, I think, wearing Balder armor. You're right, the, um, the hip... Uh, can we get him? There we go. <laughs> I love the wiggly corpses. Those, um, uh, lobstered hip covers are, um, I used to know all, all the words for different parts of armour, but whatever. Here we have, like, the second armoured corpse. <laughs> but yeah, I've never noticed that before, but you're completely right. So the night shield is the first, um, easily accessible, uh, full block shield in the game that has a 100% damage block. Um, if you're lucky, a hollow knight, uh, not knight, uh, one of the hollow soldiers will drop their shields, um, which has basically the same stats, but has less requirements to use it, and it's lighter. Yeah, I trod in a corpse, it's terrible. Um, so, like, generally, generally, if I get the hollow soldier's shield, I will just use it for, like, a third of the game, because it's so, <laughs> so good. But um, if you don't, it's worth putting a couple points in um, strength so that you can use the, the knight shield there. So the reason why the Balder knights represent a huge leap up in difficulty is that they essentially can do a lot more of the things you can do than uh, the average hollow can. Uh, this is another one of these very unfair... Um, well, no, Dark Souls is a fair game, but it is one of the, but, you know, you have to understand the rules by which it's playing. It's one of these difficult sections for new players, where they run through and, uh, there's an enemy on both sides of you, to the left and the right. Which is a good way to get fucked up by that guy. And again, Dark Souls is fair. You can see from there that there's a guy here lurking around this corner, so that gives you a chance to, to find out. This isn't an archer hallway, there's no there's no archer in here. What are you talking about? But yeah, so uh Balder Knights, essentially they can do a lot of the things you can do. Um while you've been fighting these shitty hollows this whole time, the Balder Knights actually um have uh they're much more mobile. They 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 run around, they can sidestep, they can dodge, they can backstep. Um, they do a lot of damage with fairly fast attacks, and, notably, they can parry. They have a very specific animation state they go into when they're, when it, they're like, oh, time to parry, and if you, if you melee them at all with a heavy or a light attack, while they have that um, animation state active, they will instantly parry you and do a huge amount of uh, damage with the repost. Which is uh, extremely dangerous. So, um... That's one of these like interesting things about Dark Souls, the way it sort of progressively adds these new complexities to the, the formula that it's established. These guys mostly just run around and swing their swords. Uh, they don't do anything particularly clever. And then, um, yeah, then you find the Balder Knights, and they're much more like you. They're a much more fair challenge. And then you learn how to deal with them, and you're like, okay, these guys aren't so tough, and then you end up fighting something else later that is also a big step up in difficulty. 
And it's kind of like, the difficulty is added not by making things tougher or do more damage, although that is true in some cases. It's much more about giving them more abilities, more ways to manipulate the environment, more stuff that they can do. Which I think is a much more interesting way of doing difficulty. Um, get wrecked. So he's the guy who runs through here and shuts the shuts the gate so you can't get through. Opening this up is a decent shortcut. Um, but here is something interesting. Yeah, no, it's one of those games that kind of imprints itself on your memory. Like, I just remember where everything is. So, there's an interesting little thing that I think is cool, which is that there is one of these many tensions in the game is between um, the desire to present a well-designed level that is fun to play and this desire to present a world that um, makes sense to its inhabitants, that is a logical place to exist. And... Um, the one tends to undercut the other in a really interesting way. Um, in a way that is purposeful, almost. So, as you're playing through this area, you come through here, you fight the boulder guy, you come up here, you fight the other guy, you get out onto that walkway on the outside, and then you turn left, and... What do you see? You've got this big expanse of forest, and then you've got a pathway ahead of you. If you're lucky, you notice that this goes over there, and you can go down there. And... But, if you go there, usually the player's instinct is to go through the previous area already and um, that you've already seen and finish it, and which means that you enter this big church, this large detailed environment through a side door, and when you go in through that side door, all of the enemies are pointed in a different direction. They're, that direction. They're expecting you to come from somewhere else, which is because if you look at the actual layout of this environment as an architectural space, this entire settlement is built around this, which makes sense. These people cared about their religion very much, as we will find out, sort of, later. If this was a lived space, if this was this kind of, like, sticky uppy, um, inhabited... Fortress is the wrong word, but, um, like an abbey. We have the access to the rest of the city down here, because on the other side of this is the end of the bridge that the dragon is squatting on. We'll open this up later. You know, you cross the bridge to get to this place, you come up here. This is the path that everybody who lived here would have taken. They would have walked up here through this hallway, through this arch. Here, through this, um, this, this colonnade, and over here, and through this vast gate. And they would have walked all of this way. They would continue up here, and then they would see this edifice present itself, this enormous church in front of them. And then, centred right in front of the church, we see the way in. We see these knights guarding it. We see at the back the Bereniki knight, which we will fight in a minute, who is much tougher than these guys, but much easier to fight. I say, just, you know, bombing this one down. And then at the back, the altar and the, um, and the statue behind the altar, all on this single unbroken sight line. And so as you pass through here and each individual stage is revealed to you, you get this perfect sight line and this perfect composition all the way through with these different layers, like an onion. But the player never sees that the way it's intended to be seen. Because the vast majority of players, they don't come through here first. What they do is they go, they see this turn off, they see over there, they come over here, they fight these guys, they go in the side door, and then they come out of the church backwards and see how it connects up that way. And that's just so curious to me. That is the tension. This, that, this place is set up with the assumption of the people living here having had actual human needs and operated in the way that humans operate. But the player operates like a player and explores through here and sees this. And this is clearly the critical path. This, this design is set up to channel you this way and to encourage you to come over here. So if you simply follow the way that the, the game designers have designed for you to, to go, you end, up, you end up missing out on the experience of that beautiful sightline. Um, because you never come at it from the correct side. And these guys are... Wowzers, okay. These guys themselves are also, you know, they're people in this world. They aren't players. So they're expecting you to come from the place that people come from. They're expecting you to come from the other side of that path. And that is, I think, one of the beauties of um, the design of this game. So it's actually uh, safer just to kind of like cheese blender this guy. That's not a word, nobody says cheese blender. Uh, if you just keep cycling behind him, you can't backstab him because he's too big. Although, now that I think about it, uh, black and silver knights are the same size, and you can definitely backstab them. 
He's just too tough. He's big and heavy. So if you want to, you can back off a blasting with magic, but that uh, shield of his blocks most of it, so you have to time it carefully, and this is just a bit easier, really. This might get one in. There we go. Oh, that was incredibly lucky. Uh, he should have hit me and I should have died. <laughs> So some hollow enemies can use, um, including the ordinary shitty crappy men, um, can actually use their um, their Estus flasks. It really is a, a favourite of the undead, as Oscar put it. Which I always think is a little bit unfair. It's like, no, that's my thing. I'm special. Why do you have one too? So uh, in, sh in a short bit we will be doing wizard battle with that wizard i mean they are shitty crappy men they're garbage men they're rubbish they're they're awful crap hollow <laughs> garbage dudes they're basically skeletons except skeletons are classy there's real class to a, a like a nice classic you know fleshless bony skeleton especially when the skeletons are naked like there's real like necromancy class there but the hollows are just like boring zombie men um which is one of the reasons i like the the skeleton zone of this game so i did not go by that spell but i will shortly i'm gonna drop all these souls off before i uh lose them doing something stupid where everyone can see i suppose i should put some more points in here um I don't really need endurance at the moment because I'm not using my stamina for much, but I am going to level up my hit points a bit. Uh, right, where else are we going to put points? I'll put one in there to get another attunement slot that I won't use for ages. Uh, the stats that are important for sorcerers are basically intelligence and attunement. Those are the most important. Intelligence is your damage scaling for uh, sorcery. And um, attunement uh, increases your attunement slots, which is important for having more spells. Those are the real important ones. Vitality is always good. Endurance is, is good if you want to do a lot of dodging, which you do want to do. Like, every character needs vitality and endurance, but it's less important for a sorcerer because you're not in melee range as often. Oh, dex, in dex improves cast time. I didn't know that. One of the things about Dark Souls is that it's got all these different stats and they all do different things and they all interrelate in frustratingly complicated ways uh, which I have never bothered to learn all of because there's so goddamn many of them so increasing endurance increases the amount of equipment you can have before you your rolling and movement is slowed down and um, in the endurance uh, the equipment load stat is brutal in this game it's much much more welcoming in uh, the other Dark Souls games uh, you can get away with wearing a lot more armor a lot more easily in those games. But um, generally speaking, we want to be under 25% equipment load, no matter what in Dark Souls 1. Uh, I'll put one in Dexterity, because I hate odd numbers. That's another thing that's a difficulty for me when playing uh, RPGs, is that I don't like odd numbers. I don't they, they feel untidy and irritating to me. Ah, well, you see, I've never played Demon Souls, even though I really want to. Oh, I'm not hollowed. I can kindle this. You can spend one humanity to increase the amount of Estus, your healing potion, that um, a bonfire provides by five. But yeah, so for sorcerers, um, melee and dexterity are more about unlocking access to weapons that you want to use than they are about um, the damage scaling of those weapons, especially since later in the game you'll put um, intelligence scaling enchantments on weapons and get damage scaling that way anyway. Here's everybody's second favourite character. The reason why people love him is he has this really thrilling dialogue. Forgive me. I was absorbed in thought. Quite honestly, I've run flat up against a wall. Or a gate, I should say. The thing just won't budge, no matter how long I wait. And oh, have I waited. So, here I sit, in quite a pickle. <laughs> Another good Dark Souls laugh. Absolutely thrilling dialogue as well. 
But everyone loves him because he's kind of like... Still closed. Still closed. Mm. Chubby and endearing, and he's this great legendary adventurer, except that you do all of you solve all of his problems for him. Number one is usually Solaire, like everyone loves Solaire the most. Uh except for Girl Like Substance. I I have a lot of fondness for Laurentius of the Swamp, but I don't I have trouble picking a favourite Dark Souls character because there's so many and they're all so weird. Um They're all extremely peculiar. So, Andrew's interesting <laughs> for a couple reasons. One is that he's just sitting in this tower smithing forever. Where are you off to? Oh yeah, if you don't back out of the dialogue, if you just run away, he gets irritated that you didn't say goodbye. Which is endearing. I forgot to save some souls to go uh, improve my... Uh, to go get that great soul arrow. Hmm. I was going to say Gwendolyn's not really an NPC, but actually she is... Uh, because you can talk to her and get her covenant and do stuff that way. Oh, that's another major change between um, the original Dark Souls and the remastered edition. You can pick and choose your covenants at campfires. You don't have to run around talking to NPCs. Man, it would suck to die to these guys right now. I'm just going to back out. I'll just bye. <laughs> I'm done with this place as a problem. So over there on the ground you can see the first summoning sign of the game. This is a another player's summoning sign, it's not an NPC summon sign. Because effectively you and all of the other players are the same kind of thing as another player. Alright, let's see, what has he got? He's wearing the chainmail hood, he's wearing the uh, warrior armor set otherwise, and he is wielding the claymore. Which is interesting because that means he must have beaten the dragon on the bridge because, uh, or at least gotten it to fly away because that's... Oh wow, her, her hair mesh is really fucked up, huh? Uh, that is the priest set, the grass crest shield, which I'll talk about later, the Astora straight sword, which is very commonly used by priests. Because it's that sword I mentioned earlier, which does magic scaling damage, um, but it's, it's faith-based. So, um, right, probably the easiest way to fight this guy is just to go straight up here. I think I will continue clearing out this area, um, and then I will fight the boss and then I will call it a night, because my throat's getting a bit sore. Because it's been a while since I streamed, so I'm out of practice and out of throat power ability. Which is a very important stat for streamers, you know. Um, much like your spell power scales with intelligence, your ability to stream video games scales with throat power ability. Please don't kill me, Mr. Balder. I say, sounding very timid and sad, as I actually just reposition to stab him in the kidney again. Um, oh, incidentally, one of the reasons I kindled that bonfire is because that actually serves as a staging point for exploring three different areas of the game. Oh, he's doing his irritating magic. I hate wizards. Wizards suck. Everyone hates sorcerers. This is why no one likes you. So... The cool thing about this window is that you, if you stand exactly here and, and aim it perfectly, can I, is he gonna? Yeah. His spells will um, bump into the wall and not hit you, but your spells can go through and hit him, uh, which is delightful. There's a lot of um, cheese spots in Dark Souls where you can. Uh... <laughs> oh, he got too far away. There we go. That should be fine. Where you can uh, get a sight line on an opponent that lets you take them out. This is unfair to them, but Dark Souls is 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 very difficult to the you know the player. So I think it's only reasonable to just let people um, do this if they want. Like part of the skill of Dark Souls is finding those cheese spots, using them to get through the game when you're having trouble because you've only just started and you never played it before, and it's so difficult. Um, and then on later playthroughs doing it properly because now you're good enough to know what you're doing. Right in the face. This whole swarm of hollows is a huge pain in the ass, generally. Um, oh. 
as he's picking up an item, if you interact with a message or pick up an item, you can't, like, dodge or fight. Which means that if you can't get away from the, the message to get it to go away, then it's gonna be there. Yeah, the buff lasts just a, if he if he applies the buff, it lasts a set amount of time. Um, I think it's just reapplied constantly as long as he's chanting. Um, but that buff is like a thing that's on them, rather than a thing that is like, um, like it's not a constant channeled thing. It's just reapplied constantly. Oh, he's got soul, but he ain't a soldier. Well, however that song goes. So, there's an NPC we're going to meet shortly, um, who is another popular NPC, usually hated, occasionally beloved, by people who are, who have problems in their brains, but I guess not the same problems in their brains as me, because I don't like him very much. Alright, buddy, come on. So yeah, the fact that their attacks are so much faster means that even if you've been relying on parrying, um, they're just a lot harder to learn the timing to parry. See, the way I normally deal with the uh, the Chanter here, the wizard I was fighting, is that <laughs> if you stand behind that pillar over there, the one on the right, um, you can hit him with arrows and he can't hit you. And the thing is, on this stream, what I'm doing is I'm going through kind of the game's basic critical path. I'm going to places at the times you're supposed to go there. If you dip into Dark Root Garden already, um, you can go get the longbow, and if you have the longbow, you can hide behind that pillar and just shoot him in the head over and over until he dies, and without him being able to hit you at all. Still human, are you? Then I am in love. Could you help me? As you can see, I am stuck without recourse. Sure, I'll help you. It's it's you know it's good Samaritan. It's 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 the right thing to do. You know everybody helps each other. That's the golden rule. Thank you. And you're a golden yeah. man. Sincerely, I am Knight Lautrec of Karim. I truly appreciate this. And I guarantee a reward. Only later. A lot of people say the voice acting in this game is terrible, but I think it's actually really, really good. It is exactly what it, it needs to be. It's this weird, hollow, raspy strange intonations people are very odd but that fits who they are in the world that's it would be if they would quote unquote better performances i think that they would suit the game less yes very sorry your reward will have to wait i've just been freed allow me some time i am free now <laughs> so um he's a very peculiar man that we will learn more about a long time later but, um, yes, he will relocate shortly to Firelink Shrine, which a lot of NPCs do. Um, and uh, while he's there, it's very easy to kill him by kicking him off of a cliff edge. And um, let's not question why that guy was in that barrel. But uh, what the fuck was I saying? Right, yeah, so <clears throat> when you go and find him at Firelink Shrine, he will uh, be very easily kicked off of that ledge. If you kick him off the ledge, he dies, and you can get his very powerful ring. He has the Ring of Favor and Protection, which is one of the best rings in the game because it improves your health, your um, stamina, and your equipment load by a reasonable amount each. However, if you equip it, you can never unequip it or it will break. And normally that's what I do. I, uh, I run up to him and kick him off the edge, and that's the end for him. However, as I said, I want to kind of run through the actual critical path of the game, and that means having his side quests happen later, which won't happen if we kill him. Also, uh, this is one of those areas that is like semi-secret, and that you can figure out must exist if you, if you look at the spaces and um, try and figure them out. But uh, this is how you access the uh, tutorial area of the game for a like revisit with much tougher enemies and uh, that boss that we saw right at the beginning, the very beginning. If you want to fight him, what you do is you climb to the top of that tower and hide in that nest and you need the key we just picked up off this roof. But before that, I want to go get a new spell. Hey, nice to see you. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be playing for much longer because my voice is getting sore. Um. Hey. Don't you ever use better unless <laughs> rude. 
And here he is. The laminated golden prick himself. Ah, hello there. I have your reward. Please, accept it. I am grateful to you for freeing me. <laughs> not enough for you. Well, let's not be greedy now. <laughs> I actually really like his kind of phlegmy voice. I find it very appealing. Um, but yeah, so everybody hates him because he, he murders an innocent character much later in the game. But um, he's a very strange individual. So I'm going to go back down here and see Rickert of Vinheim again, pick up the Great Soul Arrow. And then we will be going to go fight the Belfry Gargoyles, which people say is the first real boss of the game. I do not agree. Um... I think the Belfry Gargoyles are generally pretty easy. I mean, I beat them on the first try usually, unless I fuck up seriously. Um, and there's just so much assistance. I don't feel like it's meaningfully a step up in difficulty past from what the uh, the tourist demon was. I feel like it's still part of this sort of like easing you in progress. Um, I have to be very careful here, because if I press B, I'll backstep. Uh, and if I backstep, I will fall off of there and die, which I don't want to do. So even when you're just visiting the shop, you have to be really careful in Dark Souls. Ah, exactly enough. Hello. It's beginning to have you right, okay. So we should be able to go fight the Belfry Gargoyles now. And, um... Yeah, that is, that's the third major change. They added one bonfire, and oh, that's right, I was going to explain why that bonfire is total bullshit. Um, yeah, they added a bonfire, they let you use multiple items at once like they do in the subsequent games. Um, and the other thing that I've definitely already talked about, but I am really tired. But yeah, so... Um, there's various, there's a few different smiths throughout the games, and each uh, throughout the game, and each one has a different um, specialization. Wait, what? I'm not going to catacombs right now, although I am talking about catacombs, I guess. So, um, yeah, one of these smiths is uh, a giant skeleton guy who lives at the bottom of the catacombs. Um, when you get into his area, you can. Um, He'll break a hole in a wall to make it much easier to get to him later, but that hole leads into a room that is the room immediately before the boss of the area. Uh, the Dark Souls is going pretty good, but I'm going to be stopping soon because my voice is sore. And, um... Yeah, so... It was a really irritating area to get to, especially late game when you might want to teleport around because um, you unlock a, a warp ability and uh, be, you know, levelling up your weapons, unlocking fire weapons and so on, so... If you talk to him, he's how you get flaming weapons, that's his specialty. But uh, what they did was they added a bonfire to his little room. Seems like a good idea, right? So that you can get there more easily once you have the bonfire teleport. Actually, no! Suddenly you've turned this into an awful trap for first-time players, because that room on the other side is extremely difficult to get through from that angle. If you approach it from the quote-unquote correct angle, you know, the critical path angle, it's pretty easy to get through there. Uh, well, it's not easy, but it's, you know. Um, it's full of skeleton wheels, which are one of the most iconic bullshit enemies in all of Dark Souls. I say getting destroyed by a Balder Knight again. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna backstab this. Ugh. Betrayed by my own camera. Come on. Oh, that animation state is the parry animation state I mentioned previously. If you melee him while he's doing that, he will parry you and kill you. Unless you're far enough behind to get a backstab. But yeah, so it's very difficult to get out of that room um, from that angle. And so if you drop down there and you find it and you're like, Oh, I found a secret area. There's a cool skeleton guy down here. Oh, a bonfire. Fantastic. I'll rest. The thing is, you respawn at your most recent bonfire. If you've rested at a bonfire, it's basically impossible for you to, like, travel anywhere else without going to a different bonfire. Which means you get permanently stuck in a loop there. You try and get out, you die, you respawn at the bonfire in the tiny little room. It's awful. 
Uh, and I speak from experience because when I was playing earlier today, I like a, I spent like four or five hours on a character. Um, I got through to that area. I was like, oh, I'll unlock the Vamos shortcut. Oh, there's a bonfire. I know. I'll rest because I'm low on hit points, like a fool. If I hadn't rested, I could have used the homeless bone to get out that, uh, which is an item that teleports you to the last bonfire you rested at. There's lots of ways to get around in Dark Souls. I could have used the dark sign to just go directly. Um, but no, like a fool, I rested. And having rested, I had no ability to escape ever again. Oh, I didn't know he could get killed by the skeleton wheels. I knew they could, that they could get into that room really easily. I didn't know that they could actually kill him. I love the design of the skeleton wheels, but my god, they're a pain in the ass. So, <clears throat> if you talk, if you go back to Firelink Shrine, you can talk to Lautrec, and if you do that, which we did, then he will be here. I usually miss out on this because I tend to just run, zoom through this area in one, like, chunk. And, um, not bother, not, his summon sign won't be here if you don't go talk to him at Firelink Shrine first. So... Yeah, that's actually- he sounds like he's coming through a broken radio. Vamos is very strange. I assume that that's supposed to be like, well, he doesn't have a vo proper voice because he's a Skellington. Ah, uh, but yeah, so... Fun fact about summoning things to help you. Um, every player or, fan or NPC, or phantom in general, that you summon increases the difficulty of the boss you're fighting. Um, not a lot of people notice this because it's significantly easier to fight a boss if you have buddies. Um, but the health and I think damage of bosses increase when you um, when you have uh, have pals along for the ride. This is because uh, it's kind of counterintuitive the way that having a couple of other people helping you improve uh, like your ability to fight. It seems like you've got one person, okay, hundred percent damage output, you know, a hundred percent hit points. You've got two people, okay, two hundred percent damage, two hundred percent hit points. So it seems like two people should be twice as strong as one person. But, um, yeah, actually having two targets, it means that also your boss's damage output is, is, is 50% of what it would be because it's not able to, um, well, let's not dive straight off the cliff. It's not able to put all of that damage onto a single target anymore. And, um... Yeah, that's basically why. I said I was going to be silent during boss fights, so I don't make a fool of myself, but this one's not difficult. <laughs> uh, there are two Belfry Gargoyles. The second one spawns in when the first one takes a certain amount of damage. It's been a while since I damaged it so fast that it wasn't able to um, do anything, but yeah. This is why I don't think this is the first real boss of the game. That's just like, boom, and done. Yes, it does also create more openings to damage the boss. It also provides you with more opportunities to avoid getting, uh, like, completely killed. If you run away, your opponent can hold its attention while you heal up. Not your opponent, your ally. So, like, there's actually a lot of slightly unintuitive angles by which having at least one more person on the battlefield improves your ability to, uh, to fight. Which is why they increase the, the, the power of the boss to... Not to mitigate it, but to make it still feel like it's the same kind of challenge. So here we are, we've made it all the way to the first Bell of Awakening, or Ascension, or whatever the fuck the guy who told us what these are called it. Yeah, like I uh, you weren't here earlier, but I was talking about the way that the Sorcerer is kind of Dark Souls' easy mode. Um, I don't normally play the Sorcerer, but I thought it might be fun to, to use it, because it, its damage output, if you know what you're doing, is just insane. It's monumental, it's just massive, like... Um, if you fight these things in melee, it can take a few tries, um, even if you do summon in friends to help you. So here we are. We have successfully completed the mission Oscar gave us. We have rung the Bell of Awakening. Although, of course, the Crestfallen Knight at Firelink Shrine did tell us that we needed to do two, not one. And again, that actually itself reinforces this idea of kind of like, people just know what they know, like people hear myths. Because one of the themes of this story is actually the way that myths occur in the world and the way they are used for different purposes by different people and whether or not they actually mean something and so on. 
I am Oswald of Kerry, the park. Thou appearest to lack faith. Yet magnanimous are the gods. Cometh thou to confess? Or to accuse? For indeed all sins my fault. Love this guy. I don't know if you've ever tried this, but it's actually difficult to hold your arms out at an angle for a really long time, and he never puts them down, so he must do a lot of working out in his spare time to get the stamina to just have his arms out all the time. Anyway, he teaches us the best emote in the game. I don't think we want anything else from him right now. <laughs> he sells a couple of multiplayer items, uh, and some faith-based items, and he also sells the blood, blood bite ring and the poison bite ring, which provide bleed resistance and poison resistance, respectively. However, bleed is... Kind of a rare effect in Dark Souls 1, to the point where I've never needed to use the Blood Bite Ring. The Poison Bite Ring is much more useful, uh, which makes sense considering it's more expensive. Thou art welcome any time. It is only human to commit a sin. It is only human to commit a sin. I love how there's a certain you know there's an archetype of the 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 like slightly loose kind of like big, important, dignified priest who's an absolute creep underneath it. I just want to try out that... No, I don't want to try that out. Uh, emote, just to show it off to anyone who hasn't seen it, because it's great. Like, the energy it can apply is absolutely great. It's very good as a kind of, like, a bring-it-on motherfucker kind of pose, but it's also great as, like, a just a kind of an arrogant post-battle swagger where you're like, see you weren't all that. Right, okay, so <clears throat> in terms of critical path, you're at a juncture here. Having done that, you only know that you were told to go, quote, down to the depths below Blight Town. How you do that is unclear to you. Uh, it's not explained to you. If you're paying attention, you will have noticed, you will remember the locked door at the other end of- Whoa, I forgot these guys were here. At the other end of this whole zone. Um, but, um, spoiler alert, that is where you need to go for the rest of the game. <laughs> to get uh, to the rest of the game. However, oh, this, is, this isn't great. I hate being boxed in. Uh, there we go. Yeah, that's actually one of the best gifts of this game. Like, instantaneously, like, sells people on the game. <laughs> there are people who've tried Dark Souls because they saw that gif. Um, but the other critical path is that if you paid attention when you went to Andre, and it's quite likely that you find Andre, then you know there is a whole other path over here. Um, in fact, when I first played this game, not only did I get confused about where you go in the opening area, um, in fact, when I very first started playing Dark Souls, originally, right at the beginning. I um, got so stuck trying to fight the skeletons in Firelink Shrine that I gave up and quit the game and came back to it months later. And I just looked up where you're supposed to go because I was like, I heard this game is hard, but it can't be this hard, surely. Um, and it turned out, no, it wasn't supposed to be that hard. I was in fact going in the wrong direction and you're not supposed to fight the skeletons. You're supposed to go up a staircase into the Undead Burg as we have all seen. So this is one of those similar things where the game's like critical path, like the, the, the route you need to follow to complete the game is completely opaque to you. Um, it's a, just a matter of completely exploring. So when I got here, I got confused as well. Um, I forgot that the door on the bridge was locked and that I could go back. And honestly, it's easy to overlook that door entirely. Um, so I thought, well, the only other place I've seen that I haven't been to is down here. What's through here? And I go through here and I run past that demon and explore Darkroot Garden and end up still just very confused. So, that's going to be all from me for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, one of the joys of this game is the way it's tangled around itself and you kind of learn where places are and how to get between places. But yeah, it is really confusing. And for first-time players, I actually do think people should look up like recommendations about which route to take and how to find the, the accesses into it because it is very confusing. So yeah, I had fun. I hope you had fun. I... Uh... Join me in the next couple of days for the next one. It'll be announced on Twitter, and I'll, if, you, if I know you, I'll ping you about it. Um, 
And yeah, go follow me on Twitter for updates and announcements for streams and so on. Go watch my YouTube if you don't already. Um, yeah, and I have a Patreon and stuff as well, but you can find that when you find it. It's fine, don't worry about it, whatever. I will catch you later. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.